Hello, and welcome back to The Foundation Presents. I'm your host, Mike Schramm, a board member of the Foundation for West Hartford Public Schools and a 13-year-long product of the public school system. Uh, I'm here today to talk with two teachers about the grants that they received and then one of our donors who has given at the named grant level. And now I'd like to welcome Dawn Anstett, technology and engineering teacher at Bristow. Dawn, can you tell me a bit about the grant that you're here to talk about today? Well, I'm here to talk about the Manufacturing Enterprise Freedom Pen Project grant that I got that was just over $1,300. And it was poss made possible from um, Smith Brothers Insurance Company. And in this grant, students explore manufacturing enterprise mm -hmm. and through making pens. And the other thing is we're adding a kind of a community outreach or service type of thing to it. Okay. So these are the pens right here. We've got, I'll, I'll show some for the cameras, and we've got one here that's not actually in the plastic sleeve. Now, these are really beautiful pieces of work. Are they made with a kit that you get from a, from a group? How, how do you get the materials for the grant? We, um, we buy the pen, the pen innards, mm -hmm. uh, through um, a company in Pennsylvania, and um, then we buy wood blanks. And sometimes we can, um, I actually hope to use some leftover wood eventually and, and chop it down. One of the things that we got in our grant was this cute little um, chop saw. Oh, but yeah. it's ideal because it'll cut the blanks that we get, which are about six inches long, into mm -hmm. two and a half inch pieces for the students to be able to put on the lathe. They put two on the lathe with a spacer between so they can actually see what the pen's going to look like as they run it on the lathe. And so every one of these pens is made by hand by a student, is that right? Yes. Wow, th this is incredible craftsmanship. Really, I'm blown away at how beautiful these are. I, you would see these in a store selling for like $30 or something like that. Uh, now you mentioned there was a community outreach aspect to this too. Can you speak a little bit about that? The Freedom Pen Project is a, um, it's kind of a national endeavor. It was started by a bunch of woodworkers that got together and decided that they wanted to provide something for the servicemen and women away from home. Okay. So kind of a gift from home. So they make over 20,000 pens a year is their goal each year to send overseas um, to the servicemen and women um, in different, different venues. We're lucky. Um, I was able to get in touch with, or somebody contacted me who has contacts at, in Groton. Okay. So he can get our first batch of pens board the fast attack nuclear sub out of Groton, one of them. Uh, we don't know which one will go over, but we're kind of excited because then that's coming right for out of Connecticut to people going over to Afghanistan. Yeah, what a great Connecticut connection. I, I would not have thought that you would have been able to set up something like that so quickly, especially since this is the first year that you're doing this. Um, do you have a lot of student interest in, in making these? The students like working with it. On um, I started last year making a few pens here and there, and th we're up to two lays, and we have them working most days with a couple of students in each of the seventh grade classes on them. Plus, also, I have a group of students that come after school, mm -hmm. and they just want to turn pens. And it's fun because it's, it's something different, and it's kind of relaxing to, to just watch it. You know, as you're as you're working on the lathe. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of the show Parks and Recreation, <laughs> and Ron Swanson, one of the main characters. He's got his woodworking shop, and it always seems like a really relaxing space to be to zone out and make something with your own hands, which I, I think is really interesting. And it's great that there are students who are coming in after school to work on these too. Uh, how many pens are you producing this year? Our goal is a hundred. Okay. At least 100. So my hope is by February we will have 50 of them done mm -hmm. and then the remainder by the end of the year. It's a little bit harder getting it started in the first half of the year because the real big pen time for seventh grade is in the spring rotation. 
So hmm. that's when we do our our mass production project, which will be the pens this year. So they will mass produce the pens. And I actually have eighth graders. So each one of these containers just has a pen in it. We want to actually make a label so oh. that the so it'll be a student made label that will say freedom pens made by uh, and the students can actually sign their name who wow. it was made by at Bristow. Oh, that's such a nice connection. And I imagine that the students have to learn some of the equipment that they're using. So there's a little bit of a learning curve, but once you've got them up and running, then they'll be able to do it on their own more efficiently. Yes, um, the lathe is actually something that is not as quite as threatening as some of my other machines in the lab. Okay. So for for students, once they've you know they, they stand back the first time, but then once they've touched it, it kind of you know it's like oh this is easier than I thought, and they don't realize you know that it is a, it can be safe as long as they're. They're paying attention to what they're doing and, and working on it, and it's, it's easy to do. Well, that's good, and I'm sure that it's pretty empowering for the kids to be able to use this equipment and feel comfortable with it when I have to imagine a good number of their parents probably wouldn't <laughs> feel all that comfortable with the equipment. Uh, and it sounds like a great kind of real-world application of uh, the STEM learning that we hear more and more about. Um, in terms of the the breakdown of the students that you're getting involved, I, I know that the, the push is to get more uh, girls involved in STEM at a younger age. Are you finding that it's a pretty even breakdown? Or are there more boys? I'm finding that during the day it's even. Um, mm -hmm. I have coming in to, th at a learning lab time, I'll have both boys and girls wanting to sign up for the spots. Come after school, I have more girls coming in to turn, which is kind of nice because they're also the ones that want to choose, you know, what wood am I going to buy, you know, how, what does it look like, mm -hmm. and really um, help me organize, which is eventually it will be an enterprise. It will be something that we want to be able to do year after year and be able to produce the, you know, at least 100 pens that we can send out there from Bristol. Yeah, what a I am very impressed by the students who are getting involved and I'm so happy that you are able to carry out this grant and uh, really make a difference and connect students with the real world, you know, outside of West Hartford. Is this the first grant that you've had with the foundation or do you have other experience with the foundation as well? I've had grants the last 2 years. Last year we were working on robotics and we had a grant that um, allowed us to get robotic kits that to me were, were just the, you know, the, the um, you know, put it, you know, push it together with like Lego type robotics. Okay. These were ones that they actually had to assemble. Hmm. So they were following actual plans to assemble them and then program them. So it was... Wow. Um, it was a challenge, and um, th it's something that they enjoy. Yeah, that sounds like it would be really intense. And both this grant and uh, and this pen making grant both sound like there's some great tangible outcomes for it. And I'm really happy that you were able to get both of these grants funded. I certainly hope that this pen project can continue on for years to come. Well, Don, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome on Bridget Kennedy, art teacher at Conard High School. Bridget, can you tell me a bit about your grant? Uh, well, the name of the grant is Conflict, Crisis, and Creativity, and it came about um, after a number of meetings uh, with an interdisciplinary group of teachers from Hall and Conard High School. Um, these teachers represented areas such as uh, English, uh, social studies, music, and visual arts, um, and we were discussing how to, um, how to talk to students, how to talk to our students, or how to respond um, to questions or, uh, around violence in the world, uh, terrorist attacks in Paris, et cetera. And so um, we, from there we began to explore uh, immigration, 
um, the status of refugees around the world and that, that crisis. Uh, we went to, um, we all visited Real Artways in Hartford because there was a, an exhibition there of artists that were, um, that were immigrants and had come from the Middle East. And uh, one of them in particular, Mohammed Hafez, uh, really caught our attention. And uh, so from there we decided to work together and to, um, to write a grant for an artist in residency. The re artist in residency was uh, $3,000 and it was for a full day um, presentation and workshop at Conard and this, with the same format followed at, at Hall mm -hmm. and then uh, the artist retur will return um, for an assessment um, about a month later in, at both high schools. Wow, yeah. that sounds like mm -hmm. a really fascinating series yeah. of conversations that led to this grant. And Mohammed has already come to Conard, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. How did the students receive him? What was their experience? Well, they were really, I think, personally um, touched because Mohammed spent, Mohammed is a practicing architect. Uh, he lives in New Haven and he, he works in an architectural firm designing skyscrapers. That's his day job. Mm -hmm. Um, and he makes sculpture as well. And uh, the sculpture that he's making right now is in response to the war in Syria. Mohammed is uh, Syrian born. Mm. Um, but the, the students responded uh, very, they were very touched by what he said. We have a fairly sizable population at Conard of students from around the world, from Ethiopia, from Sudan, from Dubai. Um, and and they all have their own personal stories and the stories that their parents tell them. Uh, so this meant a, this really meant a lot. Students after the after the day uh, in the workshop uh, with presentation, students uh, were asked to respond to a few questions that were really uh, that really asked them to reflect on what he said, and um, they were really moved by, by his stories because his main message was about building a, a bridge and finding the commonality uh, between cultures and among cultures. And he talked about architecture as a form, um, as a common denominator, as in that we all need shelter and we all need a home. So it was a very accessible uh, presentation that he gave. Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking about my own experience going through Conard not that long ago mm -hmm. and knowing all of the different students that I was friends with who were from different countries and very different backgrounds. And mm -hmm. I have to imagine that just about every student at Conard knows someone or themselves went through uh, these, uh, these types of experiences, maybe not from Syria, but from somewhere else where there's mm -hmm. conflict. and, mm -hmm. and uh, there needs to be some sort of cathartic release of that conflict. And we're lucky mm -hmm. enough to live in a town where the students mm -hmm. are able to experience that diversity and, and mm -hmm. hopefully use it to create something really beautiful. And, and it sounds like the art that the students are working on is really that type of creative expression. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit about the actual uh, artwork that they're producing? Uh, yes, and, and before I do, just one thing that comes to mind is that um, many of the students were uh, we're also rising to this this kind of invitation for uh, empathy, I would say, mm -hmm. and understanding, um, you know, situations that are, are not theirs, you know. And I thought that that was really, I just didn't want to forget to include that 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 was very um, worthwhile. Um, and you were asking about the student work and how it was made. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the the pieces are architectural. They're uh, Mohammed started by uh, uh, demonstrating uh, how, how the work is made and he focuses on the facade or the front of a building and um, it's a wall relief uh, so it's light and it hangs on the wall and um, we use a light foam so it's not very heavy and there's a lot of found objects that are added to humanize and to bring scale into the into the equation mm. so the scale uh, is a, is a kind of a, um, it's, it's a definitely an invitation, I would say, for the viewer. Uh, 
So for instance, we were asking for donations of doll furniture for quite a while before he came mm. because his work often has um, at least one piece of furniture and there'll be windows and doors. And he, he also uses um, painting techniques with acrylic paint, um, perhaps to, to imply a distressed surface. Um, so it's very interesting. They were very intrigued watching him work for quite a while in the, uh, the layering of, of color and texture and also the, the detail that he added um, to these pieces. Mm -hmm. well, I am not much of an artist myself and was not in my mm -hmm. time in the West Hartford schools, mm -hmm. but I can imagine that mm -hmm. seeing someone mm -hmm. do, who's known for doing this type mm -hmm. of work, actually doing it with them and then coming back to offer some uh, response, critique, mm -hmm. what have you, to their artwork. It must be a, a meaningful connection with them to their work and hopefully the, the broader Connard and West Hartford community. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that um, there are a couple things that come to mind is that in the way that um, students were working in the same way that Muhammad does, and he explained that he works intuitively. Mm. And so there were, we had um, a wide range of materials, both found objects and small items, uh, from toothpicks to wire, and it was kind of endless, the amount of things, small things that we had to doll furniture. But students were really um, in, encouraged to uh, trust their instincts, instincts and to work uh, intuitively. They worked in pairs, so they were collaborating and discussing their, um, discussing some of their ideas together. Um, but it was very, very uh, rewarding for them I, and for to to watch this creative process unfold during the day. And working intuitively, you trust your instincts, so you don't really spend a lot of time worrying about what it's going to look like. Mm and which often is kind of an obstacle in the creative process. So it was phenomenal to see the product, which was, I'd say, about 85% finished at the end of one day. Um, wow, yeah. that quickly. Yeah, huh. very, they did it. Um, and they were just totally energized to have this permission to just follow their, you know, follow their instinct and follow their, um, their kind of natural inclination when they look at these materials, how do they go together? How do you want to put them together? Um, so we have f 14 pieces. We had um, groups, 10 groups uh, with two people, uh, people working in pairs, and then we had four people working individually. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're hoping to see them, we will see them displayed not only at Conard, um, some of them may be. Um, in the our district-wide show Artbeat oh, in March, mm -hmm. and some of them may be entered into the highly competitive Scholastic um, exhibition every, that is every, an annual exhibition um, and competition, statewide competition. So we'll definitely be seeing the work. Well, good. Mm -hmm. I'm. I, I can't wait to continue to see all, all the artwork. And I think going back to your point about the creative expression, I think mm -hmm. that students are under so much pressure mm -hmm. these days to mm -hmm. follow a certain script and mm -hmm. make sure that they're checking all the boxes for their resume and everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I, I am happy to hear and I mm -hmm. hope that the students were happy that they were able to uh, creatively express themselves in this way that really is meaningful and impactful and connects them to broader issues that are really important. Uh, well, Bridget, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Great, well, thank you. And now I'd like to welcome on Scott Brown, who is a donor to the foundation and married to one of our co-presidents. And uh, Scott, your named grant this year mm -hmm. was Bridget's grant that we were just chatting about. Correct, right. Um, so how long have you been involved with the foundation? How did you get involved at the beginning? 
We started the involvement with the foundation really when our kids came into school and we, we heard about it and really started pretty small with just doing simple teacher gifts kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the year, we'd make a donation in the, the teacher's names to the foundation. Um, and then the more we heard about it, the more we were impressed with what they were doing and all of the, the grants that they do. Um, and having our kids go through and being beneficiaries of some of those grants really kind of got us interested. So when did you make the leap from these smaller gifts that you're talking about to getting involved with the foundation and having a named grant each year? Yeah. We've been doing named grants for about five years. Okay. Um, the, the last two years, we've actually done two different named grants. Um, this year we did Bridget Kennedy's, um, and then we also did a uh, sponsored uh, a trip to um, the uh, United Nations that was done by the Charter Oak students. Okay. Um, and that's something that we've done for the last two years, and the, the students have really enjoyed that. I think we actually talked about that grant on one of our earlier episodes back in mm -hmm. May, and mm -hmm. I remember thinking that that was a pretty excellent grant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you been able to meet with the teachers and, and the students involved and, and see what comes of the grants? Some. I mean, we've certainly we've talked with, with Mrs. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. our, our son is in her class, and so he was, it was very nice that we were able to sponsor a grant that he actually got to benefit from. Yeah, how great. Um, and, and he really enjoyed the program. He really um, felt a, a connection with the artists and really enjoyed the, working on the project. And, and having an artist come in and being able to see how somebody who not necessarily makes a living at it but does this on a professional level mm -hmm. um, is really able to kind of get those creative uh, things going. Um, so he really enjoyed that. Now, you obviously have uh, a somewhat of an insider view of how the foundation works, but mm -hmm. you've also been associated with the foundation for many years now. Right. Um, can you speak a little bit about how the foundation has evolved in your eyes, any changes that it's made? Uh, has it gotten broader in scope or reach, anything like that? I think it certainly keeps growing each year. Um, I think the, the, the number of grant applications that they get in each year is always increasing. Um, and, and what's been great is they've been able to, through generous donations for, throughout the community, through their fundraising projects, um, been able to increase their the money that they're able to give in, in awards. Mm -hmm. um, and as more and more teachers get involved and you hear more schools getting involved, I think that just really helps to, to spark and to stimulate other teachers to do grants. And so the, the, some of the creativity that we're seeing in the grants I think is really increasing. And it, it's great to watch that kind of energy um, take place in the schools and really uh, enliven the students. Yeah, I think that it is, uh, it's so important for the students to have something beyond the traditional curriculum. And, mm -hmm. and West Hartford's obviously a great school system. Right. We've got great teachers, uh, parents are very involved, and that is the backbone of any public school system. But the fact that we have this foundation mm -hmm. that can fund $80,000 worth of grants in the last fiscal year uh, is really exciting and, and kind of a difference maker. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you came to Connecticut, when you were looking for a place to live, mm -hmm. was West Hartford attractive because of the education, or how did that work? Largely. I mean, it's one of those things where, as we, were, we came from Texas, um, our daughter was in school there, but came up here, and she was in fifth grade at the time. So we had some experience with public schools there, and then coming into Connecticut, um, and looking for some place that we knew was going to have a good school system. Uh, we were really impressed with the, the reputation that West Hartford had. Um, and even after um, being here for a couple years, we were, had thoughts about going back to Texas, but really one of the, the important things that kept us here was just how good the schools were and how much our, student, our, our kids were, were enjoying um, everything and, and knowing that this kind of quality you just don't see lots of other places. Um, and so it's been great to be able to, to, to help be a part of that. Um, and I think one of the, the nice things is having a foundation like this, um, I think it helps to bring in those creative teachers as well because you, you've got the, the very uh, bright, very uh, motivated, uh, energetic people who are looking to do things outside of the traditional curriculum. And the foundation really provides an opportunity for them to do that. Now, we obviously have this TV show to spread the word about the foundation mm -hmm. and and educate some of the folks who do give to the foundation and those who don't as well. And if there is one thing that you could tell someone who doesn't give to the foundation, what would it be? 
I, I think one of the simplest things is it doesn't need to be a name grant. Any type of donation helps. Um, and if, especially for parents in the community, talk with your kids and talk with them about some of the programs um, or watch programs like this. And you know, there's, there's flyers and things like that we put out. And you see the amount of creativity um, and the, the, the energy that these types of projects bring in the classroom. I think it's really vital to keep the West Hartford schools at, at their level of excellence, that we allow these new kinds of innovative programs to, 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 be, to flourish in, in, the, in our schools. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your support for the foundation and for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Glad to do it. Well, folks, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're interested in learning more about either of the grants that we discussed today or any other grants through the foundation, please visit fwhps.org.